just a big Charleston contest. I am uh, Stefano. I am an Italian man. You've reached the house of unrecognized talent. So the mantle of greatness waiting for Johnny Padres to step in and have it hoisted on his shoulders. It's the last half of the ninth inning. Johnny Padres into his windup in the 2-2 pitch. A let-up curve, a ground ball to the left side. Huey Reese has it. The throw to first, and he's out. And the Dodgers win. Domo Arigato, Mr. Scotto. And welcome back to the Brooklyn's Dad Talks About Everything podcast. I'm your host, Michael Scott. Today, as we are wont to do on this podcast, I will make a couple of corrections and clarifications from previous podcasts, and we're going to look at the difference again between redemption and blessing and apply it to this age. So hang on. You know, I really wanted to get the Vin Scully call on that final out of the World Series 1955. Ladies and gentlemen, the Brooklyn Dodgers are the champions of the world. I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. That was a Dodgers TV call. I got the, I got Bob Neal's radio call. That's the uh, Bob Neal from Cleveland. Anyway, back to Rosie's Bar. Things have gotten a bit dicey here at Rosie's Bar. Some Marines have come in to cause some problems, but we can still see the light at the end of the tunnel. About a week away from actually having a domicile and getting back to my regular microphone. So, anywho, as I mentioned, we want to do a couple of quick, quick, quick corrections. First of all, I need to apologize to Johnny Padres. I was thinking this as I was saying it, but I I said that Johnny Padres was the Phillies pitching coach in 2008 when they won the World Series. Well, he would have been about a billion years old. So, I I said, that's not right. It was 93. It was a 93 NL. CS champions, the National League champion Phillies team, Kurt Schilling. He was Kurt Schilling's pitching coach for those years with the Phillies. So apologies to Johnny Padres uh, and Jackie Robinson. And the Jackie Robinson, when I talked about Jackie Robinson, I said, and baseball, I said that, uh, you know, for good or for bad. Well, obviously it was good. It was a tremendous thing. I mean, the integration of this country changed everything for, for millions of people uh, in many ways. And it wasn't, I wasn't saying it was for good or for bad that it happened. I was saying it was for good or bad that it happened in baseball, meaning baseball has been, it, it was part of American fabric, so intertwined with, with American life that uh, it was, it was a, a channel that worked. But it shouldn't have had to come to that. It should have been done. I mean, Truman could have done something or uh, at the state levels. Things should have been done at the government level. I'm saying it's it's somewhat of a shame that it had to come through something like baseball. Although baseball, again, was a good avenue. It's just a shame. So that's all I meant. Obviously, I love Jackie Robinson. Obviously, I grew up in a home with my father who was a Brooklyn Dodgers fan who super loved Jackie Robinson. Also, on my story from my – this is more important. This is the most important thing. When I talked about the, the game, I hit the home run and we won one nothing, and our pitchers – I said combined for a one-hitter and their pitchers combined for – a two-hitter. It was just one pitcher for each team. Dempsey pitched all six innings, seven innings, I guess, for the um, <clears throat> six or seven. I can't remember what we played back then. Probably seven, I think, at Pony League uh, for his team, the Summerfield team. So anyway, I'm sure no one cares but me. But it was as in my head, I was thinking, and eh, okay. The other and one final thing before we get to our topic of the day, uh, when I talked about the old Earth. Now, among old Earth people, and I said, you know, between in that gap, in the gap theory, if you go back and listen to that one, I said you can put as many squillions of years as you want to put in there in the gap. I'm not saying that fossils are squillions of years old. I'm not saying that at all. I mean, I'm a believer in the flood. I believe in flood science. I believe that the questions that can't be answered by the evolutionists um, in geology and ancient history and biology are answered by the flood and creation of man and the earth as we know it now being about 6,000 years ago. Now, that old earth, those squillions of years, the universe itself, the stars, that I don't know. I think that's beyond anybody's understanding or study. And exactly what's left on this earth, exactly what's hidden under this earth, I don't know. So there could be some mixing of that. The flood, I think, explains an awful lot of things in science that they can't explain. You know, fish fossils at the top of the Himalayas, that sort of thing. Among, among many other things. I don't want to get hung up on that. That's not my topic for today. So anyway, moving on to the topic of the day, if Charles and Hawkeye will step aside. We talked about redemption. We talked about you can be redeemed. Israel was redeemed out of Egypt. They were baptized under Moses. 
completely dry, by the way. <laughs> they were the ones who were dry in that scenario. It was the Egyptian army that ended up getting wet. But they were identified with Moses, and they crossed the Red Sea. They had already had the Passover, so they had the Passover, pictured Christ's blood, the blood of the Lamb. So they had that. Now they were being identified with Moses, and they were stepping uh, – they were crossing the Red Sea into redemption. So they were redeemed people, and of course – they start acting wickedly. They start desiring the world again. They're still redeemed. They're still out of Egypt, but their hearts haven't been sanctified and their minds haven't been sanctified yet. So when they come to the Jordan, they send the 12 spies into the land. And of course, only Joshua and Caleb come back with a positive report saying, this is a wonderful land over there. It's beautiful. Look at the grapes and, and the flowing with milk and honey. And the 10 spies came back and all they saw were the giants in the land, the difficulties, the we can't do this attitude. So you have a a redeemed people. So the Lord keeps them in the desert for another 40 years. Remember, it was about an 11-day walk to Kadesh Barnea where they were going to cross into the land, the promised land. But they never did. Well, some of them did. Uh, Joshua and Caleb eventually did. And those who were under 20 years of age. But all those people who believed the spies who said, we can't go in there, they were not allowed to go into the land into blessing, because they didn't have faith. They didn't have faith in God to step into that blessing. When we talk about this age, and I talk about the body, and I talk about the blessings in the far above the heavens, and you can go back and listen to messages about that. My message on the New Covenant, I talked somewhat about that, but of course, even in our, we talked about the mystery. This age, where Paul says in several of his epistles that he was the only one given this revelation of the particular age we live in. This age where we're no longer looking for a kingdom on earth, which they were always looking for. No longer looking to the the promises made to the fathers, because we don't have fathers. Those are Israel. And all those things will come true for Israel. All the promises for Israel are yea and amen. God will have them come to pass. But our blessings are in the heavens. Well, how do we step into those blessings? It's the same thing. You have to step into them by faith. Remember, redemption is a free gift. We did a whole message on by grace through faith. And grace is an absolute free gift. And God, as we've talked about in 1 Corinthians, he has already been reconciled to you. God was in Christ reconciling to the world, reconciling the world to himself. He is holding nothing. He, he is holding nothing against any man. It's a, There's nothing between you and God except for faith. Now, that's redemption, though. That's stepping into redemption. That's stepping into resurrection life and a free gift. But the blessings in the far above the heavens, that is... Something else that has to be believed. You have to go and read and study the book of Ephesians to begin with. And then, as Philippians tells us, compare the things that differ in Scripture. The problem with most Christians, or Christianity, I should say systems, Christian systems and denominations, is they want to look at and amalgamate everybody from Adam through Abraham into the law, Israel into the church, into the to Christ's earth's ministry. They want to amalgamate all that into the same thing. But it's not. It's clearly not. Otherwise, you have these contradictions. But they're not contradictions. They're just different promises for different people. I have four children. If I go on a trip and let's say, you know, I buy, I go on a trip to Philadelphia and I get a, an authentic Steve Carlton jersey signed and I send it to my son and I write a letter and I say, Dear Boston, that's my son's name. You know, here's an authentic Steve Carlton jersey. I had it autographed. And it says on it, to Boston, love Steve Carlton <laughs> on, the, on the jersey. And then my daughter gets it, and she opens up the package, and she reads on there, it says, to Boston. She goes, well, here's my shirt. Well, no, she can enjoy the shirt. She can appreciate the shirt. She can learn something about Steve Carlton from the shirt and Philly's history. But the shirt isn't hers. It's addressed to somebody else. And, I mean, a whole thing on this, when I used to do my public speaking, you know, when I was a supply preacher, I had four different letters that I came up with for four different people, somebody's wife, his daughter, a friend. And you would write things to some that you wouldn't write to others. Now, you can learn from all the letters, but you have to know to whom the Lord is speaking. So in the Lord, even in his earthly ministry, when he's saying things in his earthly ministry, again, we're going to do a whole podcast on the Red Letter Bible, these Red Letter people. I'm a Red Letter Christian. I only fo- I follow the red letter words of Jesus. I'm not hung up on Paul's misogyny or whatever. They don't. They don't. Have they actually read the red letters? Is my, my question for the red letter Christians always, have you actually read the red letters? We've talked about some of the things that Christ said on this, on this podcast. 
What does it mean to have to go before the Sanhedrin? He said that's what's going to happen. It's in the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount. That's the Magna Carta of the church. No, it's not. <laughs> unless you've got a Sanhedrin. Unless you're going to be throwing people into fire. Because that's what's in there, among other things. Giving to everybody who asks of you. I mean, these are things... I, you know, again, I read an article years ago in the Selma paper when I was in Alabama. Of course, another one of these progressive Christians who was going on about the Sermon on the Mount. She's not into Paul, and she was all about the Sermon on the Mount. Well, I wrote her a letter, and I said, okay, I've got some bills. Everybody, in fact, every time I've seen this online, every time, I write, I write a comment, I write something to whomever wrote it, and said, hey, red letter person, he said to give whoever needs from you, whoever asks to borrow from you, you need to give it to him. Well, I've got some medical bills. I've had medical bills for me and for my children. I said, how about you pay my medical bills or you help me pay them? You know how, many, you know how much money I've seen so far? Absolute nothing. Zero. Zero. And I tell them that, well, I don't have to pay you. Well, that's what it says. Now they're going to quibble over it. Now they'll, they'll say other things that Christ says, and it's an absolute truth, and you better do this and do that. And again, the, the ironic thing is the words of Christ are used by the progressives, and they're also used by the super hell-loving fundamentalists as well. So when the Lord talks about people being thrown into Gehenna fire, they love that. So I'm not just picking on the progressive red-letter people. I'm picking on the fundamentalists who have to have their hellfire. They live and love the idea of people being tortured. The vast majority of humankind being thrown into fire and tortured by God himself without hope. I always say this. Next time you, you burn your finger on a toaster, you just, oh, ooh, you just touch it, and then you got to put salve on it and everything, and it just burns. And then and just imagine that. Imagine that over your entire body, a thousand times worse, forever, no hope of relief ever, and God's the one that's doing it. Now, if that's true, the only thing you'd be looking forward to is the great white throne because they get taken out of hell for at least for a while to get judged, if that's how you interpret all that. It's, I was going to say it's idiotic, but it's beyond that. It's an insult to God. It's unscriptural. This is why we have to understand and rightly divide the word because we have to know those things that are given to us. We talked about previously the constructions for widows. During the book of Acts, Paul said, do not get married. He goes, you can get married. It's not a sin, of course. But his, his advice was, the time is short. The end is near. Basically, do not get married. It's not going to do you any good. But then after the book of Acts ends, and we're into this period that we're in now, Paul says, I think that young widows should get married. <laughs> you need to get married. Well, what changed? Well, I mean, an entire dispensational change occurred. A different hope was before them. A different future was before them. So, again, I mean, that's a simple example. There are other examples as well. There's more doctrinal examples that, that can be looked at when you start comparing Paul's post-seven Acts epistles with his epistles during the book of Acts, the book of Acts itself. The book of Acts itself looks far more like the book of Matthew and Luke and the miracles than it looks like the post-Acts epistles, in which those things disappear. References to the Old Testament essentially disappear, the prophets Abraham, David, those things disappear for the most part. Paul can no longer heal anybody. He leaves his friend sick at Miletus. He tells Timothy to take medicine for his stomach's sake. He's no longer healing everybody who comes to him. These things, everything, everything in Mark 16 that you see in the book of Acts about the miracles, raising people from the dead, being bit by snakes, and living. All those things in the book of Acts are a continuation of the earthly ministry to Israel of the Lord. That's what Pentecost is. We've covered that. Go listen to that. So what we have to do is, is we need to understand the mystery. And I encourage you to go back and listen to the podcast that says the mystery of dispensationalism and start to make these differences. Uh, you can visit my blog, www.contextorconfusion.com and look up these things where I lay all these things out and the differences and this age and the dis distinguishing characteristics of this age. And uh, how we can step into that blessing and have your mind open to understanding. Now, as you can tell in this podcast, I'm not saying we're the only real Christians. It's not true. <laughs> uh, because we're a very small number of people who have come to this understanding. You know, and I fellowship with most, the vast majority of the Christians I fellowship do not believe this. So it's not, a, it's not, I'm not separating from people over this. I'm not standing there saying I'm a superior Christian because of this. 
or I'm not running around my church yelling at people about it. It's something that people have to come to through their own study. And if you don't, that's fine. To have eternal life, you don't need to understand that. You need to trust in the death, burial, lack of decay, resurrection of his own power of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you, if you believe that, if that's where your hope is, if that's where your trust is, if that's your only hope for life beyond the grave, it's a free gift. It's by grace, through your faith. That's true. But it's stepping into these different blessings. We see this all through Scripture as well. Again, the, the major example would be Israel stepping into the land and refusing to believe God's provision. But we also see it in when they get into the land in the book of Joshua, uh, at Ai. You can go look up that story. And also when uh, in the book of Judges, where it ends with every man doing that which is right in his own eyes. And then in the history of Israel, where good kings and bad kings and Israel is either turning to God or turning away from God, and then there's blessings, or there's God not acting directly in their lives. I'm not saying God's not going to answer your prayers. He can. God has his own purpose, and he loves his people. And you're still his people. We're all still his people. I'm just talking about stepping into this particular blessing, which is the blessings in the far above the heavens at the right hand of God where Christ sits. And that's where the hope is. So we're going to finish there and take on a different topic next time. Hopefully we'll be getting close to getting back to camp. BJ can find another roommate because I'm sick of it. So until then, have a nice day.